Okay, um, so we're continuing on with the uh, user interface um, section of the workshop. And the uh, uh, next presentation is by Baki, and he's going to be talking about the R gadget uh, environment. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Bjarti Ferralvason, and I'm, I, I work at the Marine Research Institute in Iceland. Marine and Freshwater Research Institute in Iceland, to keep that correct. Uh, and I want to present here some work that we have done on sort of modernizing the, the uh, inter interface on top of gadget using R. And this is a co cooperation between me, Jamie Lenton, and Pamela Woods. Um, so in this talk, I was going to tell you a little bit about gadgets, its origins, and uh, sort of the structure. So the rest of the, the talk makes sense to you guys. And I also have some concluding remarks at the end of it. Now, Gadget is a, as you may have heard, it's an open source, age and length based, multi-species, multi-fleet, multi-area assessment model framework. It's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, it is, it's, it traces its origins back to the uh, 1990s or mid 1990s when uh, there was a multi-species effort, both in Iceland and in Norway. And, um, <clears throat> And they were decided to create a software program called Bormacon, which is essentially is a sort of conceptual uh, sort of descendant of a multi-species model called Multispec in Norway. Um, now, the, yeah, I think so. Uh, or maybe, maybe, I was in high school in 1992, I was 11. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, so I must, must admit here that none of this work is, is, is by me or anything like that. Um, but there's been, there's been, been some development. Bormacon has gone back and forth. There was a uh, fork in Norway, which was a single species variant of it, which was called Flexibest, which is it's a Norwegian play of words, which is, it really means flexible assessments. And, uh, but in the, early, in the early 2000s, there was a European project that uh, merged these projects together. Into, into Gadget. Now, the original goals of Gadget, no, it's of Bormacon and Gadget, therefore, were to mimic the, uh, the dynamics of the Icelandic system and sort of flexible. So this would be a general framework that you could sort of mimic the uh, dynamics there. And the key motivating example was the uh, cod capelin interaction. So you see cod capelin is a species that just is a migratory species that feeds in Greenland, comes to Iceland and leaves a lot of food in, into the system and then spawns and dies. So you have, you need, and there's, there's notable migration events that occur when, when you see cabling coming in. So the, the key idea was to try to, to mimic the, be able to model these migrations and uh, in a flexible way. So the, the sort of design goals were to include migrations, consumption, uh, natural mortality, and growth, uh, of course, maturity and spawning. And there's an, another feature which is we want to often want to have is external recruitment, which is recruitment from adjacent stocks. There is a cod stock in Greenland that some, sometimes wanders into Icelandic waters and then becomes part of the Icelandic stock. So, and of course, we want to be able to compare, or we wanted to be able to compare data whenever it's available. So if you don't have any data, then fine, but if you have data, then you'll be able to use it. So this is sort of a helicopter view on the, how gadget is, is structured. It's, it, the key concept is a substock, where, where you, which is a unit which is homogenous to the various processes which are affected by, by which affect the stock. So in, in this idea, you, you can, you, each the sexes are, if you want to model these differently, uh, these sexes are different substocks which are related. Uh, similar to immature and mature stocks and other things. So in the substock, it stores the, the numbers of fish at age and length. And these substocks, they live in areas, which or er, in an area or areas, depending on how, what the user defines it to be. And these, you can have many areas, but some stocks live in one or the other. Um, and then you have uh, harvesting through fleets. So there's a fleet object you can define, and you can define multiple fleets, which will have, could, which can have 
interaction to or can uh, harvest different stocks. So you can have different selectivities for, the, for each stock or not harvest the stock at all. And then you have a, you have a time thing. So you have a schedule of, of events that occurs and the time step is, uh, is user defined. So you can define as many time steps within the year you, you like. Um, and these time steps, of course, can be uneven. So just to give you a sort of a dummy example, here's, here's a model of uh, sort of how you, you can, what you can create. Here's a model of COD, where you have uh, Im immature and immature, and then the immatures, they mature into, into the immatures. Um, you have, you can have pre uh, predation, that is cannibalism in the, in the model. And then you can add a additional predators like minke whales, which is a com taking a sample, which is nice, would be an Icelandic one. And then you can include a time series of, of food to, to balance the consumption equations. And these just are basically time series of nutrition. And then you add a human dimension into it by add, adding fleets and you can, you can flexibly say which fleet are harvesting what species. And if you want to compare to data, you can, the, the model objects, they create data that go into a likelihood and this is a weighted likelihood component. And you can see that they're, depending on uh, how the data is observed, the, you, can, you can pick out the, uh, the age length, for example, from the, from, the, uh, commercial, uh, from the fleets, whereas you would look at the survey biomass indices on directly based on the, uh, on the, uh, the stocks themselves. Now the user interface is then necessarily complicated. You have a sort of main file that says where all the files are. And then you have these, which, are, which I do not here in red, is the, uh, the basically the simulation part of the model where you, you define what's going to happen in the simulation. So you spend, there's a special file for time and area. And there's, as, depending on how many stocks you have, you, ha you have different stock files. So if you're one stock, there's one stock file. If you have more, more, more than one stock, you just have more than stock, more, one stock file. And each one of those stock files then has these references attached to it. And of course, the other th things, you have fleet files and tagging and, and other food sources. And the blue part here, which is the likelihood files, is, is basically the, where it is the only place we actually put in data, or which you want to compare with. And uh, then, yeah, and you know, there's an optimization and a parameter file. So I will show you how the stock file looks like, the, uh, the parameter file looks like, and the likelihood file looks like, just to give you a flavor of what's going on. Now, this is a stock file. So the stock file just looks like as just key attributes that you have to type in a value for. And, and, then you, which, and the red ones here are the ones which are basically required. You need to specify the minimum, maximum age, length, and stuff like that. And, but this, the ones you see here, which, the, which are been given a value of zero now, are optional attributes. So if you want to have migration, for example, you can turn it on or off. And same with uh, growth, uh, consumption, whatever. And uh, whenever you add an optional attribute into it, you uh, need to add some more information, so defining what this optional, optional attribute is. So here I'm turning on the growth and this is basically formulating a simple uh, enough, the growth equation. And you need to specify some parameters and how you're going to uh, distribute the growth according to the mean growth. Um, so what you see here, which is a very gadget specific thing is that whenever you put in a number, you can actually also put in a model variable. So uh, here you have, uh, every, you, for the growth parameters, for example, you see there is a, you can put in four variables there, which is L infinity, K, and then the, the weight length of alpha and beta. And, but instead of a number, you see there is a hash sign and then there's a, there's a string. This tells Gadget that we, you, here, here is a variable that can be optimized and needs to be read from a parameter file. Uh, in addition, you can also put in functions of these variables. So you see that, see that thingy this is one. See this bit here? This thing here tells you that the, that the, the cut case can be multiplied by this number. And this could be more, more and more elaborate. You can, for example, do a fourth and uh, function in there. And, and also an additional feature here is that all these variables can be 
turn into time variables, which means that they can vary with time, depending on what you want. So, and then the, whenever gadget is looking into, a, into what the value should be for these parameters, um, it goes to the parameter file and uh, checks out the value for these. There's, you know, of course, there's an upper and lower value, and you, and you can choose whether or not to optimize by putting, putting a one and a zero in the optimized column. Uh, the likelihood file is basically is a, a long list of components telling which data source is going to be used in the optimization. You tell the model what data is going to be used and how it's going to be treated. Now, the data is just given here, and it's basically just a data, data table with years, steps, and areas, ages, and lengths, and then the value, uh, the number, excuse me, uh, the, the observation. And you notice that there's, uh, for, the, for the area, age, and length, there's a, there's a label, not a actual value for this. So these are actually aggregation labels, so you can aggregate the data any way you, way you want. And in, therefore, you need to specify lookup tables which are already called aggregation files or ACK files. And these ACK files, they look something like this. You have a key and then there's a value describing what the aggregation is. So you can imagine when you have tw 10 to 20 likelihood components, adding in this whole thing is by hand is a nightmare. A lot of people can tell you all about that as well. Um, now, there's also a... Uh, an issue here, which is uh, reproducibility. I mean, when, you, you, when you're building these models by hand, you tend to copy models from previous, previous model runs, which sort of worked, and then you modify them, which can leave some, some ghosts in the system, to put it that way. And uh, so here's a picture of that. We, have a, we were revising the model for Tusk, the assessment model for Tusk, and, as we bought it, and there was a bit of a ghost in the system. And, uh, which turned out to be that the, the model had been copied from Southern Hague, and there were some very lengthy issues that was coming on. So, um, and this sort of, we had all these problems with the, as I mentioned, the data sources. Like, you, yeah, I mean, you have, a, okay. Something to do here. Yeah. You were right. Okay, fair enough. So we, we provide the solution, sorry, uh, that uh, they, we generate all these model files using scripts, using our scripts, and uh, to, to tackle the data issues and all the asset, uh, necessary data issues, we have a database system, which is basically our package that calls a database. And uh, we generate all these models using, using uh, we store all these scripts in a, in a version control system. Now, the idea with, the, with the, our gadget environment is to basically capture the entire process, similar to what Altna was telling us earlier on. And uh, so we, we have the uh, sort of the two, two final approaches. There's, there's a database system, a database uh, package that handles all the data issues. And then we have a package which uh, basically defines the models and uh, extracts the output from the model and the projections, all that, set those up. Now, uh, the package which generates the input files are, is called our gadget, and uh, that's a, that's, and when it's manipulating the files, it utilizes the, the, the modular uh, uh, way the, the, the files are created. So as you see, the, so with the likelihood file, these are components, and also with the fleet files, there are components that you can just swap out and uh, put, in an, put in again. And, and also in the stock file, there are these sort of optional features, which, is, which, we, which we also uh, consider as to be components. So, uh, so when we are defining a, a model, a stock file using our gadget, we uh, simply define where, where the uh, model is going to be. So this is going to basically say that here's the tree, uh, the beginning of the tree, which I showed you earlier. Um, we define a stock file using a function called gadget stock. And this could be a new file or this could be a existing file. So you can edit files which are already there. 
uh, then you can use these gadget object functions and man manipulate each component in, in turn. So you can take the uh, you can you can you can take the stock attributes, which are the sort of the, the key attributes, and define those. If you want to turn on and off the growth, you you do that. If you want to add natural mortality to it, so here I'm creating a dynamic example which has just has zero natural mortality, and some, and some other optional features you just, just add here. Uh, and then you, at the end of it, you just write it into a, into a file. The, the beauty of this is that you can create uh, related stocks quite easily. And you know what you've done. So, for example, if you want to have a northern stock, here's a, say I had, had a cut, the cut stock was a southern stock, and then the, the, uh, I would want to have a similar stock in the north. And I want to copy, it all, copy all, the, all the, uh, the settings from that file. From, from that stock, I, I can just take the, the object here and just update the necessary bits and write that out, and I have a separate stock. So it will make, make, make life much easier than you can be able to trace what's going on. A similar thing is that you can create model variants. So if you want to test the same model, but with a dome selectivity, selectivity then you just create a uh, get what's, what's called a Gatsing variant directory and which is going to be contained within that directory. And then you would have, and you only write those files which are going to be affected. So you can keep a track on what's been going on. And other files can be similarly updated, fleet and likelihood files, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into that. And since this is a forward projection model, there is no difference in how you set up a projection into the future and how you set up a, a uh, a fitting model, a fitting model. Now, we have also have this a database system called MFDB or MyFM database, which was a, a product of a European, uh, well, funding. And the, essentially it's a database system that stores the data in a minimally processed form. So you take the data uh, from various sources and make sure that they are sort of stored in a, uh, with, uh, make sure that they are in a sort of simple form, but you do not aggregate. So, so you have individual landings and logbooks, or catches from logbooks. You have uh, sort of catch data, and these are all by location. You still store it by that, but if you want to do any kind of processing, which is related to your survey or whatever, you do that before you put it into the system. And then you have routines that extract the data in, in the proper form for your assessment model. So this, these routines, they, uh, they, they handle all the aggregation that is required for your assessment work. And then this whole thing is, is, can be pushed into our gadget again, which writes out the likelihood file and the, the appropriate likelihood files, uh, data files. So just to give you an example how, how this is, you basically just query your database using some, some aggregation commands. You basically tell it how many area, how many how you want to treat it. So for example, here I'm going to take all the age data, which is, is, is available, and I'm going, to split, I'm going to aggregate the data by 20 centimeter length things. 20 centimeter length things. And split it up into different time steps. You can, you can either have quarterly or whatever you like. And so, and if I want to have more than one area, I'll just change this query here. And uh, this whole thing, then retains all the information on how I aggregated the data. So writing this into a file in, in, in our gadget is going to be a breeze. So it handles all the lookup files and all that you need to have. So you basically need to then just focus on what you're going to, how you're going to treat the data in the model. Yep, just about to be this. Um, so MTP also has a bootstrap feature. So it uses a spatial bootstrap to, uh, to to create uh, data replicates and uh, so which can can allow you to uh, to uh, uh, what do you say? compare models which are different in a sense so from di di either either different uh, modeling pl platforms or just different model variants using within the gadget framework and the whole procedure that I've shown you uh, is pretty agnostic is works with a, with just a few loops and uh, and slight modification and a few if statements. Uh, so there are some other additional tools in our gadget that helps you to, uh, to get the fit. 
there is a uh, there is a a likelihood uh, there is a you, there's a function that, uh, uh, that calculates likelihood uh, uh, weights for using iterative reweighting function. Uh, there is a uh, there's a di model diagnostic tool which uh, which just extracts the necessary information that you can use to uh, to uh, to assess the model, do the diagnostics, and there are some other features like uh, forward projections, which sets up a forward projection for your model and a user recruit. That's been something that people have asked for, and uh, very deep down, there is a Hessian somewhere if you want, but I don't advertise that much. And uh, so, so I think sort of experience of this is that uh, it's it's been very useful to have the proper handling of data uh, being processed throughout the whole thing, and it's also very useful to uh, to have this whole whole set scripted. We did we uh, from my experience is that. Uh, it is almost like turning on, pressing the button, uh, but almost, you, know, you always need to do some diagnostics and there's always something that goes wrong, but that, uh, that, that whole, that this, this whole procedure makes this a lot easier. Uh, we are aiming for a tighter integration. So uh, there will be either, we are going to clean up a little bit the gadget code because that's starting to be very archaic. Uh, one of the things we are focusing on is, of course, trying to put TMP, has been discussed here. And, uh, and there's also some, there is, there is also focus on the ability to do a full feedback MSC has been, has been discussed here. So um, here are some useful links. Uh, I would, if, you, if you're very interested, I would just go to uh, the, uh, the Gadget website. There are some useful links there. Um, and here are some examples of scripts that, have, that generate the advice. And uh, here's the database, and there is a course online here on how to use Gadget. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, thanks a lot, Michael. So we have time for questions. Yeah, Andre. I'll be direct to it. Um, yeah, I was wondering about the scripting. You, you, you were implying that it overcame the problem of copying and pasting files. Mm -hmm. um, how true is that? Because essentially you can't see the file you're updating. You're just adding, you're just changing options inside the structure, right? I, yeah. I can see equal problems with script, uh, the sort of uh, R-based updating to the default structure. I'm not sure that solves it. And I, I, I do identify with that because I've seen mm -hmm. several SS input files that look remarkably like some other stock. Uh, so this is a general problem. I'm just not sure how you get around it. Yeah, the uh, sort of my comment to this is that there are so many different different files you need to to, to edit, and uh, if you if you script the uh, the editing of those files by by making them sort of species agnostic or making sure that they if they are need to be specific, be specific that the, the whole procedure is scripted in a way that they can, can account for these, these uh, stock specific issues, then this, this problem is alleviated by, by uh, greatly alleviated, just put it like that. But of course, yes, it's true. If you, if you give people scripts, yeah. they, they tend to do their thing with them. I mean, but I think, I, I, at least from my, from my experience, giving this to a, to a beginning new user for Gadget, I have by both taught these sort of traditional way and, and this new way of doing it. And these things, it, it becomes a lot quicker for them to adapt, especially if they, are, if they are within my institute. Because then they can basically use this whole, the whole suite of, 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 of tools. Yeah, uh, Rick, you had a question? Uh, Jim? Yeah, I was just wondering if you could share a little bit about who developed some of this stuff. Was it professional programmers or was it biologists? Um, well, it, it sort of began, began with uh, me doing all this stuff. And then I had a little bit of a chat with uh, Jamie Lenton. And uh, he came back to me maybe three weeks later with a much better solution to the, to the whole thing. So yes, there was a pro he's a professional programmer that uh, both and also with the uh, MFDB he he was he was the uh, he he created that so um, 
so yeah, that, it, it's been it's been very um, useful to have a professional programmer on this when when developing this. And, and just for experience wise, is it that you can actually go into it now and, and change something now that you've done some of the design work or? Um, I, some bits um, I'm still sort of um, have a little bit of troubles with, uh, but it's more to do with I'm just trying to wrap my head on, on different ways of dealing with these things. Um, but uh, most, for the most part, it's, uh, it, it, when you have the fundamental structure set up, which is the gadget file structure, for example, uh, the rest of the uh, the rest of the uh, the work does becomes a lot simpler. So all the uh, I mean, like the, the function like that is like the gadget fit function, which is the uh, which gathers all the data and sets up the, all the runs, which are which uh, you do you need to do. Um, that bit came a lot clearer and less 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 maintenance than required to do that. So, okay, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. No, just where you had the websites. I didn't have a chance to write them all down. This one here? No, the next. And this? No. Yeah, this one, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Mr. Like a comment and a question. <laughs> um, as far as I understand, you're still saving ASCII files to disk. No, database is to read the files, but then you have to generate the gadget files. You dump them all on a disk, and then you call gadgets from within R, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but I never <laughs> look at the. It, we, we're getting to a stage where you can actually just turn this this whole whole thing off. No, I was, just, I was just actually going to add one advantage of moving things to TMB, which is you don't need to do that anymore because you can manage everything within the R environment. Of course, R still assesses the disk, but in a smarter way than just writing ASCII files. I fully agree with that, and uh, that's basically what we're, we are aiming at. But taking a, taking a tool which is uh, from 1990s is, is, not an obvious, this is not an obvious task. Okay, any other questions? Um, I got a question. Mm -hmm. So you're doing this in R and everyone else is doing it in R. Um, are there any deficiencies in R that you've come across that you might consider using something else to do, if not all, but components of, of the interface to uh, these programs? Well, many of these, these deficiencies are being worked on, I mean, can be alleviated by calling other programming languages like C++ or, um, or Python for that matter. So I don't, I, I basically see R as some kind of a duct tape. You're duct taping all kinds of systems together. So in that respect, I think R is fine if everybody uses R and Python could be useful here, but I haven't seen as, uh, seen Python as useful in, in, in doing, doing, uh, Diagnostics. So, I think there, there is the the, the, plat, there, the that is why I'm using R mainly is is the is the diagnostic ability of R, and and then have, doing all the rest of it is uh, is is useful because R is a natural language to me. Also, as as that would be. So, given given that you know, most at least young, young stock assessment scientists know how to use R, then R is the obvious choice for the system. And it also allows the ability to integrate other um, code, if need, and, you know, other programming languages, if needed to make something more efficient or, or if a professional programmer was employed for something in their you know, environment, it was Java or something like that. Right? Mm -hmm. So on the front end, R makes sense. And on the back end, if R can do it, Efficiently, efficiently and easily, then maybe that's okay. But if, if it can't, then we can employ some other programming language to do it. Yeah. So any other questions? Okay, if not, we will continue on. Thank you. <laughs>